James Day, public television pioneer and chairman of the CUNY TV Advisory Board, passed away in April 2008. His legacy includes the series Day at Night, which aired for 130 episodes beginning in 1973. The series features interviews with many of the great thinkers and achievers of the 20th century. These 30-year-old programs have been restored. The interviews remain fresh and relevant today, exploring issues that are still important to society. Showing them again is CUNY TV's tribute to Jim and his contributions to public television. Joan Baez was tidally summed up by one magazine writer as a folk singer of great renown, a pacifist of great conviction, and a dazzling celebrity. It's likely that she would herself be satisfied to drop all but the phrase pacifist. Since the late 50s, when she arose to a kind of legendary fame as St. Joan, the striking young lady with the unearthly voice that seemed to echo the vaguely alienated feelings of a whole generation, an abhorrence of violence has been the central theme of her life, her actions, and even her music. Despite the enormous success of her concerts and records, she prefers to think of herself as a pacifist who sings, not a singer who happens also to be a pacifist. She's the co-founder with her friend and teacher, Ira Sam Pearl, of the Center for the Study of Nonviolence, and also the author of a small volume of reflections and recollections entitled Daybreak. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me ha dado la marcha de mis pies cansados. Con ellos anduve sin dades y charcos, playas y desiertos, montañas y llanos, y la casa tuya, tu calle y tu patio. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me ha dado la risa y me ha dado el llanto. Así yo distingo dicha de quebrantos los dos materiales que forman mi canto y un canto de ustedes que es mi propio canto. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto. Joan, my high school Spanish isn't quite up to that song. What is the message? My high school Spanish doesn't exist, but I did uh, get involved enough recently, I guess, in the uh, because of my work with political prisoners and then the coup in Chile that inspired me to to do a long-promised album in Spanish and to meet some... Long promise to whom? Well, partly to myself, partly to my father, mm -hmm. who's uh, born in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I planned a trip to Mexico to kind of try it out. Took a crash course in Spanish uh, in, for a week in Los Angeles, six hours a day, six days a week, and then got on a plane and grabbed a Spanish-speaking human being, <laughs> sat down next to him and said, Yo necesito hablar español. We spoke for three hours, and I got off the plane, and the um, the local television came up and said, in terrible English, "Do it is better for to speak Spanish or English." I said, "Por qué no español?" And then I just realized I had I was speaking in Spanish, terrible Spanish, but I was doing. Despite it. Despite the fact that your father was born in Mexico, Spanish was never spoken in your home as you were growing up. Then. My mother was born in Scotland. I see. And so uh, that was the they dominant didn't language, parlay. Uh, yeah. yeah. What was the source of your strong feelings about pacifism? Your father was a Quaker, was he not? And I suspect that must have been some influence. And both of your parents were, were uh, children of ministers. Both my parents were children of ministers. And I think my mother and father both innate pacifist types. And my mother just very naturally, I mean, mm -hmm. would never come by it through reading or through studying or whatever. She just is that way. And then my father sort of coming to terms with himself I think when I was about five he started going to Quaker meeting and that's a very dangerous thing to do is to sit for one hour in silence even one hour a week where you're forced to, to when well, you say he came to terms with himself he was a physicist he was a physicist and as a physicist and a good one was being offered lots of jobs to do defense work and to take contracts and uh, 
And he realized in a very short period of time that he could never do that. Mm -hmm. So he went on the rest of his life doing teaching, which he also loved, you know, and then eventually working with UNESCO. Mm -hmm. And I think that what probably what his Quakerism did for me, I didn't even realize until very recently that, that I have no nationalism. I mean, I have no um, nationalistic feelings about anywhere which is a blessing. You're really not patriotic in the narrow sense of that word, then? No, I, I mean, I discover that I'm passionately patriotic to people. I mean, people, but it just doesn't, I cannot pick a side in the situation. Um, I suppose I could, you know, if I had really lived in, in one place and, and, oh, for instance, I mean, if you work, like when I worked with, with Martin Luther King in the South, naturally there's a side that you see. But the way he worked, you know, was, was the style of a pacifist seeing that beautiful, um, a uh, documentary on him the other night, I was reminded every time he stepped out of jail, every time he got up from having been beaten, he, he keeps saying, we have enough love to make up for, for what you haven't got. Yeah. You know, I thought, oh, well, I sat in tears for two hours just remembering and seeing how they managed. It was just stupendous. In your book, Daybreak, with some recollections of your childhood, there's a constant refrain that runs through that, as you know, and then we moved. <laughs> yes. That was your childhood, moving constantly, wasn't it? Yeah, we did move constantly, and then later on, I tried, I mean, in many ways, I think it was, um, it's, it's hard for children to move, you, know, you just develop friends, and then all of a sudden, you're a new kid again, but I realized that what I've always said was, I'm glad that they kept moving, because I, because a small town, any of the small towns we were in, had we just stayed, you know, there's no way to really grow, or it's difficult I mean, you to would have really become grow. provincial, I suppose, or would have feared to become provincial at any rate. I guess so. I yeah, mean, one of the towns you lived in, I don't know how large it is, I've never been there, was Baghdad, which uh, most of the towns were in America, but you, your father did go to Baghdad, and that apparently had some influence upon you, if only because your mother kept you out of school for a year. Hooray for my mother's yes. decision. You said that well, you didn't realize what it did for your creativity until you had been le released from the chains. Well, I have always hated school, and, and it's been a little rough on my father, you know, who spent his life trying to get enough money to send his three daughters to school and we all rebelled you know all three the oldest one stuck out two and a half years of college really only for for my father i think uh feeling guilty about it. she hated it and then i lasted about two and a half hours at boston university and then my younger sister um got through high school in france by doing an overseas course and having her boyfriend answer the last test on the <laughs> last possible night you could do it and then getting her equivalent what did you hate about school I thought it was terrifying and cold, and and I know that my own situation, I was uh, weakened rather than strengthened by by overprotection from home, namely my mother. I mean, if she had said, you know, get out there and fight, which is probably it's the only way you can get yeah. through public school, then I would have been stronger, maybe blinder. I don't know. Sure. But you ran home. And I ran threatened. home, and uh, your childhood seems to have been obsessed with with fears. It wasn't what you would call a secure childhood in that sense. No, I think that overprotection does not make for security, and mm -hmm. I would be, you know, I think that's what happened. And, uh, You're a mother now. Can you exercise that same conviction upon your son? I've seen psychiatrists and therapists and so on working with my own fears because they were really debilitating for so long. And, and so I, I think I worried that if I had a child, I'd pass them all on to the child. And first of all, a lot of them, I've just attacked them, you know, for instance, afraid of flying, and the fear came so strong. <laughs> my poor manager, we were in the middle of a tour, and I stepped off the plane, and I had almost lost my vision on the plane, just out of screaming terror. I said, I don't care whether we go by donkey or bus or what, I'm not getting back on a plane. And about a year later, I realized that was impossible. So what do you do? I mean, you either confront it and just do it, and so I, a friend of mine was a pilot. I said, will you go with me? He went about 10 flights with me. And then, I, then everywhere I went, I took a plane. Hmm. And we knocked that one out of the yeah. way. You, know? you apparently were, uh, uh, I was going to say fearful, not really fearful, but uh, you considered yourself as not being very beautiful, something I bring up, because the, quite the contrary is the general consideration now, uh, as a kind of feeling of ugliness. That well, I was skinny, and I was dark, and where we lived was in, the t in New York, the town, they, they, they thought we were niggers because mm -hmm. uh, they'd never seen a black before or a Mexican. Mm -hmm. And um, then in Southern California, it was just as bad to be 
a Mexican. We were Mexicans. We weren't Chicanos you're really then. You're really almost as waspish as you can get, <laughs> except for your father being born in Mexico. Well, I don't know. Maybe Just to have suffered racial did. prejudice uh, must have had its effect upon you as well. Oh, I think so. I, th I think it was, it was kind of subtle, but I was excluded, you know, from uh, the cliques. That's partly being a new kid and partly being yeah. dark-skinned. Mm -hmm. And this business of moving constantly, having to make new friends, right, I exactly. suppose. Yeah. What about the music? Where did that start? You took up, took up the guitar, I guess, at what, the age of 12? I took up the ukulele at the age of 12 or 13, I yes. see. And uh, my father's professor had a ukulele in the attic or something, and I started to play. And I've always been very convinced that, that a lot of the motivation was simply that I wanted friends. I mean, I became a court jester in the schoolyard at noontime by imitating Elvis Presley and playing the ukulele. Yeah, I loved music, you know, but I had no vibrato, and there was certainly no maturity to my voice. And but then, um, then I, I developed a vibrato, which I, which there were jokes about. It was written in Time magazine years ago that I stood in front of the mirror and wiggled my Adam's apple, and I did. You know, and then I got in the shower, and because it sounded better in the shower of for hours, bobbling my Adam's apple up and down to get a vibrato. Then eventually, it developed on its own. So I had a voice, you know, mm -hmm. and and uh, there was a strong desire to communicate. And then at about age 15 or 16, I became very, very politically conscious. And just in a, uh, I don't know how to say it, it was a Joan of Arc-y way in a sense that I didn't necessarily know very much, but I knew what was wrong. No. And you want to do something about and it? And I want to do something about it. So I would get up on a soapbox at any noon hour, any class. I mean, I sat in school during the air raid drill because I knew the air raid drill was ridiculous and so on. And so that then was the, the beginning music, of the protest. Then, yeah, then it all mm -hmm. began to overlap. What caused the political consciousness at 15 or 16? Was this meeting Ira Sandpearl that did it, or was that the non-violence? Well, no, thing? what happened meeting Ira Sandpearl was the beginning of articulation of oh. it. The feeling had been there. I remember in 10th grade, um, writing a, an essay, they said, your philosophy of life, you know, in one page in one or something pages. like that. <laughs> and so, but I remember the image. The image was of the earth, and all these little dots all over it, and they were all people. And I knew, because partly because of Baghdad, that some of them were starving and dying in the streets and in terrible pain, and I couldn't stand it. I mean, I felt... You were exposed to considerable cruelty in Baghdad. In Baghdad, we were, yeah. I mean, you know, a beating, a, beating a, um, an old drunk or an old beggar. It was a beggar. We landed in the airport. Somebody was, some police were clobbering an old beggar, and I... I, mean, I could, this I, is going to have I, an influence upon a young girl. I, it was unbearable to me. Yeah. And so... Uh, and beating, I still beat animals to death, things like that. And then I wouldn't be able to sleep, and I wouldn't want to eat. So you had these feelings that yeah, so came then, to be articulated later then? I think so. The problem was finding the articulation and finding what to do. I mean, because the feeling... I remember standing up in concert at probably age about 20 in the South, and there were, I had strong feelings, and I wanted the audience to be integrated, which is very funny because there were no blacks for any particular reason to come and hear me sing. And so I'd make this stipulation in the contract that they couldn't have a segregated audience, but then we'd have to call up the local uh, SELC office and say, some, send somebody down <laughs> to the concert. And, um, but I remember standing in one of those concerts knowing I wanted to say something, and I just said to them, there's something I have to say, but I don't know what it is. And everybody looked as embarrassed as I felt, yeah. you know, and then eventually I'd be able to... Was the music a help in that respect? Was it a way of but saying? Yes, then I'd start to sing, and I... And then maybe a year later, we went back into the South, and this is exactly around the time of the Birmingham Bull Connor, mm -hmm. you know, s spraying down children in the streets. And I went and sang at black schools. And what happens there is they had no money. Nobody ever came to sing, so people would come and hear me just because it was something to do. And the whites who had heard about me would come onto the campus, and it was the first time ever that a white had stepped foot on those, ca on those campuses. So that's pretty much what I was doing at the beginning. Of the... Did you ever feel uncomfortable, alone, afraid, up on the stage singing in groups like that? Or does the music oh, kind of weld you to the audience? And well, after I start belonging? singing, it's all right. It's all right. But I remember that the one I was thinking of just now was, My was uh, Miles College, because the, the, uh, there were arrests going on in town. I mean, that was the day's program. Yeah. I didn't know that this concert would coincide with the biggest day of arrests they'd ever had. And I remember being absolutely terrified because I didn't know what would happen. I wasn't thinking of that kind of fear so much as the fear of, I mean, here's little Joni Baez up here in front of this enormous crowd and well, trying to move that crowd. Thinking back to the childhood fears and the 
Oh, I, I think all the fears boil down to the same thing, Pretty. which is just a fear of somehow being snuffed out, you know, or, or, or being, or not existing anymore. A fear of not having an identity, I suppose. I think that's, I think that's a real fear. I suppose in the end it would, it would be a fear of death. I mean, in one way or another, mm -hmm. it boils down to being, just being afraid that you're going <laughs> to, everything's going to stop. Or the, on the stage, you could say, be afraid that you'd get so small that you wouldn't be there because you yeah. feel so tiny and so helpless. When uh, you started singing coffee houses in Boston, didn't you, and were quite successful, and the, your first uh, big success was the Newport Folk Festival yeah. when you so I was came, discovered. Okay. Discovered, kind of. Did you come uninvited? You came, no, I, I was invited by Bob Gibson. Uh, oh, that's right. I read you came in a Cadillac hearse, the only theatrical <laughs> thing you ever did in your life, I think. Oh, it was fun. I was bumming around with a bunch of Harvard semi-dropouts, and they had bought some beat-up old hearse. And since Clara Ward had a huge purple Cadillac, Clara Ward gospel singers on it, so we said, okay. So we took white tape and put Joan Baez on the side of this old beat-up hearse, and uh, they drove me around. And <laughs> but out of that, and then the subsequent uh, uh, Newport Jazz Festival, your record sold enormously. What I'm asking is that you never capitalized fully upon your own popularity as a singer. You've always li limited your concerts. You've never made the maximum amount of money that you might have made at any time. Has music always been secondary to other things? Well, it's always gone hand in hand with other things, which means that that could only be 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've seen, this is another blessing, you know, that, that I've, I saw at a very early age what the, quote, entertainment world seemed to do to people, and I wasn't interested. And um, I wasn't interested in making a lot of money, and I just, I'm just grateful that I, that I wasn't and I'm not. I mean, I live very well. It's, I'm not saying that I live poorly or give all my money away. I give, I give most of it away because I don't need it. Um, but those are just things where I feel as though I was lucky because a lot of the people I see around me in showbiz would like to, quote, do good things. But they're so wrapped up and have heard so much rhetoric in, in show business and entertainment that they don't know where to begin. Plus that they're still trying to stockpile the money and the land There's and the There's always that next goal that's a little bit higher that, that uh, yeah. eats, eats you up. Also, I was lucky. I mean, I never had to do the fight tooth and nail to get onto the... Everything was handed to me. Everything. I mean, do you want to sing here? Do you want to sing there? And the, and the amounts of money that were offered were just astronomical to, to somebody my age. And, so money doesn't mean very much to you, except as, as you little. need it, as you... As I, I mean, I enjoy it. I enjoy it partly because it can accomplish things for, the, for other things, mm -hmm. I mean, that I want to put it into. I mean, I have a foundation, and most of the concert money goes from the foundation into uh, groups and organizations, mostly direct, neat, sort of nonviolent action things. And then the more recent projects I've been working on and are... Well, recently, all of my energy, just about, aside from the music, has gone into building a campaign to abolish torture. Which What's the is, campaign? To abolish torture? To abolish torture. Um, torture right now being on the kind of a hysterical upswing. Um, what, what kind of torture are we talking about? Torture of human beings Any in kind? about 60 countries in the world. Oh. Um, from Literal torture. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a shock to people, and in this country, it's it done under... It's done with the group that was started in London in 1961 called Amnesty International. And uh, in, in countries in Europe, Western Europe, some countries have enormous groups of Amnesty International, and it, it's based in London, a huge research department. Um, since 1961, 10,000 political prisoners have been freed from, from Amnesty's What's work. What's turned your attention away from, of course, the, you, you devoted a good, a good deal of your energy to, to protests against the Vietnam War, that at least technically is over. Is that what's turned your attention to this new... In a um, sense, yes, because um, I think all of us are looking for a new handle. I mean, my politics inside me haven't changed at all, but I think that finding finding another place to work where I meet more people and I'm exposed to, to, to different ways of action, it seems a good time. In a sense, working with Amnesty International has been almost tailor-made for me, and it and it's brought me, it's working with uh, political prisoners, prisoners of conscience all over the world. So I've learned about them, where they are, what they've done, um, you know, how insane the, all of these governments are. I've always known it, but this makes it more specific. And then also in a way it was saying, 
I really enjoyed working with a group that gets a, an immediate result. It's kind of like a treat for me to do that. John, you say your politics haven't changed. It's been 15 years since you've become a public figure, and a good deal has happened to the world and to you. The war has ended. You've been in and out of marriage. You're a mother. You're on the far side of 30 now, which is supposed to be a magic border of some sort. <laughs> yeah, wheelchairs and bandages. Have your priorities changed at all? Have your convictions been modified in any way by the experience and by events? Um, things have been modified only because of the birth of the son. Mm -hmm. I mean, the marriage folded. Um, or that, in a sense, a marriage would modify some things, but, but it's modified by having a boy who is terribly important to me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so when I'm, David and I share the child, he, he loves us both and we share time with him. David and I both travel, so I keep Gabriel part of the time. And when he's with me, he comes first. I mean, he mm -hmm. comes before anything. And, and I think it'll be that way, and I think it's right. Uh, it, it's my own feeling yeah. that's right. Several years ago, you said it's hard to start out as an entertainer and end up, end up as a person. But that's what I want to be to do because I just want to be a decent wife and a mother. That was 1970. Mm -hmm. Still, insofar as mother is concerned, that yes. still comes first. I yeah. mean, for instance, I would say that, that uh, I'm a fighter. I've always been a fighter. A nonviolent fighter. A nonviolent fighter, mm -hmm. yeah. But, I, um, but if something terrible were to happen in this country and I felt that... that uh, it was either stay here and fight or skip the country. Without this, without my child, I would stay here and fight, whatever that means, mm -hmm. I don't know. And with the boy until he's uh, the right, you know, an age where I really feels always on his own, I feel I, I would take him somewhere mm -hmm. so that he'd be safe and I'd be his mom, you know. That's the difference in the modification. But as far as pacifism and tactics and, and, and the roots in nonviolence, they just continue. I mean, all. They just continue. Mm -hmm. All of the things that would have tested it to the nth, it seems I've been through, including sitting in the bomb shelter in Hanoi. Yeah. And in the, in the bomb shelter, under the bombs, having these arguments with people who were saying, ha ha, now haven't you changed your mind? And I say, to what? And they say, don't you want to see those bastards get shot down? I said, I'd love to see those planes come down, as long as I know the pilot has already bailed out. Ooh, and they'd be furious, because they wanted me to say, I want to see him die. I didn't have any desire to see that jerk die. I mean, it was terrible, and I'd call him terrible names. And I'd sit down there shuddering, thinking he was going to kill me. But in the same time, in sort of a practical sense, knowing that his death wasn't going to have any practical uh, effect on the lives of the people around me who were being bombed. In the years since you've worked against violence, I don't suppose violence has been reduced very much. Do you get at all discouraged about the difficulties of I tell you, for pacifism. I tell you what I do think happens is that, that I, of course, I become discouraged on and off. But it's usually just when some internal thing has happened, or mm -hmm. right, a kid has had a bad dream, you know. And then I think I'm discouraged about the world. But uh, as long as I mean, I don't have great expectations to begin with. Mm -hmm. I don't expect that that my work is going to have. Uh, I don't expect the things that I really want to see to happen in my lifetime. The end of the military. The end of the nation state. Would you play us another song? Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, if you would wave how many minutes we have. Then. Yes, we have about four minutes. Okay. I'll give you a, a, a very quick history on this song, and which was um, uh, a Chilean songwriter, very well known and very much beloved, who was taken to the national stadium. I guess this song is important to me, and he is important to me, because the way he died... Uh, it was with so much strength. As I figure if I can die that way, I'll know uh, that I lived right. And he was arrested by the military junta and taken to the stadium, and he went on singing, which was a big threat to them because he sort of rallied the prisoners together. And, and they finally cut off his fingers, and they said, okay, now play for us. And uh, he went on singing until he was beaten to death. And this song's about him? This song was just written by him. It's a love song written by him. Recuerdo a Amanda, la calle mojada, corriendo a la fábrica donde trabajaba Manuel. La sonrisa ancha, la lluvia en el pelo, no importaba nada, ibas a encontrarte con él, con él, con él, con él, con él. Con él. Sirena, de vuelta al trabajo 
y tú caminando tú iluminas todos los cinco minutos te hacen florecer te recuerdo Amanda la calle mojada corriendo a la fábrica donde trabajaba la sonrisa en ya, la lluvia en el pelo, no importaba nada, y vas a encontrarte con él, con él, con él, con él, con él, que partió a la sierra, que nunca hizo daño, que partió a la sierra, y en cinco minutos puedo destrozado. Suena la sirena de vuelta al trabajo, muchos no volvieron, tampoco Manuel. Te recuerdo Amanda, la calle mojada, corriendo a la fábrica donde trabajaba Manuel, Manuel, Manuel. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me dio dos luceros que cuando los abro perfecto distingo lo negro del blanco y en el alto cielo su fondo estrellado y en las multitudes al hombre que amo. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me ha dado la marcha de mis pies cansados. Así yo distingo lo negro del blanco y en el alto cielo su fondo estrellado y en las multitudes al hombre que yo amo. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me ha dado la risa y me ha dado el llanto, así yo distingo dicha de quebranto los dos materiales que forman mi canto. El canto de ustedes que es mi propio canto. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado.